I'm Sam. Welcome to Brickwall Pictures. Today I want to examine the Oscar and BAFTA nominated and Palme d'Or winning Triangle of Sadness. La Palme d'Or revient au metteur en scène de Triangle of Sadness. With his latest film, Ruben Ostlund has joined the elite league of directors like Francis Ford Coppola and Michel Haneke to have won the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival twice. Fewer than 10 filmmakers have ever pulled off this feat, and Ostlund just became the ninth. I've seen some pushback against Triangle of Sadness since the Oscar nomination from people who call the film too blunt and on the nose. And to a degree, I think it's fair to say that its core commentary on capitalism is certainly upfront and obvious. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, but regardless, I think you're only looking at the film on a surface level if that's all that you walk away with. The presence of something obvious doesn't mean that subtleties don't exist elsewhere within the work. What I find Ostlund to be particularly great at is taking a small, loaded moment of conflict and digging into it in a nuanced way that sends ripples out throughout the rest of the piece that are both character-driven and imbued with complex social commentary. His 2014 film Force Mayor is perhaps the purest example of this. Husband and wife Tomas and Ebba are vacationing at a ski resort with their children. When an avalanche seems to be headed their way, Tomas panics and flees while Ebba is left behind with the children. The avalanche itself turns out to be a non-issue. Nobody is harmed. But this non-issue has revealed a major issue in the family's underlying dynamic. This brief moment of cowardice from Tomas could be insignificant in the hands of a lesser filmmaker, but Ostlin makes it the crux of the entire film, as it ripples outward and informs all of the drama that follows. The conflict may have started as an unconscious fight-or-flight response, but it gives way to deep-seated resentments and familial strife as the issue festers. The avalanche is a catalyst that brings buried and ignored conflicts between the spouses bubbling up to the surface. The drama is grounded in these specific characters, but is also scratching at broader ideas, traditional gender roles in particular. Force Mayor forces its characters, and by extension its audience, to reckon with the expectations of masculinity juxtaposed against a reality of cowardice. As he revealed on the Q&A podcast with Jeff Goldsmith, one of Ostlin's motivations for writing the story was to peel back the curtain on the charade of masculinity and the expectations that entails. I was looking into like statistics about how we behave when it comes to catastrophe situations. And I was looking into fairy time catastrophes like ships, like Titanic to Estonia. And what you can tell is that the one that survives in these extreme situations are men in a certain age, and the one that dies are actually women and kids. So the idea that men are like sacrificing themselves for the women and kids is actually not 100% true. It's actually the opposite way around. And it was the, the clash about our expectation of the man and how how we actually behave and, and what survival instinct is bringing out of us. That was really what, what I got interested in and why I want to make the movie. Men want to think that they are the type of person, or at least want to be perceived as the type of person, who would sacrifice themselves for the safety of the women and children around them in a disaster scenario. But historically speaking, this is rarely ever the case. Approaching the drama in this way keeps the film both personal to the characters and universal to those watching it. His next film, The Square, touches on some similar ideas, but to keep things focused, let's jump right ahead the Triangle of Sadness. Though the situation is far less grandiose than an avalanche, Ostlin explores a similar dynamic in Triangle of Sadness when Carl and Yaya argue over who should pick up the check. Don't you remember last night you said you were gonna... You said you were gonna pay for food today. At the end of the meal, you said, thanks, tomorrow I'll get, I'll get it. Sure, but then you picked up the bill and I thought you wanted to pay, so I said, thank you, honey. Okay, but it was there for such a long time, I mean. I didn't see it. You didn't see it? I, no, I, I didn't. Again, the conflict is born out of the expectations attached to gender norms and one party going against those expectations. Both potentially insignificant moments escalate when one party denies reality to save face, with Tomas denying that he fled in fear and Yaya denying that she saw the check, both of which are obvious lies. 
In each film, third-party observers and societal expectations weigh on the characters' decisions, actions, and how they express themselves. And both seemingly small moments have far-reaching implications that extend beyond the situation at hand into other facets of the characters' lives and their relationships with each other. No matter how much the characters in Triangle of Sadness profess that it isn't about money... It's not about money. God, it's, it's not about money, yo, yo It's not about... It always is. But it's also about traditional gender roles and the societal expectations tethered to them. Well, when it comes to you and me, we're dealing with roles that I hate. I mean, I don't want to be the man whilst you're the woman. I want us to be best friends. I don't want to sleep with my best friend. No, that's not... There is an expectation that Carl, as the man in the relationship, will pick up the bill. It's an expectation that Yaya doesn't even need to consider. It's second nature to her. For Carl, it's a gender role expectation that he has willingly fulfilled in the past, right up until this very moment. His reason to buck that trend now comes from a conflux of motivations, some of which he's only subconsciously aware of in this moment. Yaya makes more money than him. Yaya said she was going to pay for this particular meal already, and most interestingly, he cares too much about her to want to leave their relationship in such a transactional state. They may have gotten together in the first place for purely transactional reasons, because it was good for their public images and boosted their social media followings. But over time, real feelings have developed between them. This last point isn't something that Carl can properly articulate in the moment, but it becomes clear as the ripples of this conflict move outward from the restaurant. It ripples into the car, where their conversation cements this as a hardline point of contention that they can't simply move past or brush aside. It ripples into the elevator, where their argument escalates to the level of potentially doing lasting damage. A moment that seemed small at first now holds enough weight to end their relationship. And it ripples into their hotel room, where they are now forced to confront the underlying problems in their relationship and the dynamic between them. Notice how the number of prying eyes around them shrinks with each ripple. From the packed restaurant, to the lone interloper of their driver, to just the two of them in a public setting, to the two of them in complete privacy. For anyone, but especially for two people who exist in the public eye like they do, the way they are perceived is worth a lot. It is only when they are alone that their words and feelings can be unfettered. It strikes at the heart of one of the great human fallacies, that we by nature often care more about how strangers we may never see again perceive us than we do about how the people we actually care about in return perceive us. With intimacy comes transparency, and with transparency, the bad is out in the open alongside any good. The ripples of this moment continue into the second and third acts, even as the film drastically shifts in focus, plot, and subject matter, and even drifts away from these two being the main characters altogether. Carl's decision to look at an engagement ring for Yaya wouldn't happen if he hadn't been forced to reflect on their relationship and reckon with the depth of his feelings. They wouldn't even be on the yacht in the first place without that seemingly insignificant moment, since their trip in a way is a gesture of good faith toward the longevity of their relationship. Carl's feelings of financial insecurity continue to resonate in the second act as well. From the price of rings to another passenger casually buying Rolexes, he's out of his depth. It depends. It depends, you know. You mostly get free stuff, to be honest. Mm -hmm. We got this cruise for free. Good. Who looks paid for the tickets? Not bad, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Good, yeah. I guess so, yeah. Of course, the film is lampooning the vapidity of influencing and wealth, but it is still grounded in character. Carl's status in life allows him to mingle with the uber-wealthy without actually being a part of them. He can't keep up with them, and he can't truly relate to them. But he also can't relate to or empathize with those who belong to a lower wealth class and social structure, like Abigail and the shirtless crewmate whom he gets fired. Carl is stuck somewhere in the middle, blind to those below him, unable to reach those above him. He's a fake amongst phonies, and he's trapped on an island between two worlds. Get it? Trapped on an island? The scene with the shirtless crewmate again ties into the film's exploration of gender roles set by society. It is extremely telling that Yaya simply greeting and smiling at the crewmate is considered tantamount to cheating, but Carl literally sleeping with Abigail on the island is justified as necessary once the rules of society have been cast away. Get it? Cast away? 
Sure, the commentary on capitalism is blunt, but there is still plenty of depth worthy of analysis in Triangle of Sadness, and plenty of subtle touches, such as the ambiguity of Yaya's rejected card when she does try to pay for dinner after the argument with Carl. It would be easy enough to take this moment at face value, but if you read into it and into her admission later on of being so good at manipulating people that she does it without thinking about it, then sure, maybe she tried to pay and her card was declined, or maybe she gave the waiter a card she knew wouldn't work as a sneaky, underhanded tactic to manipulate Carl into paying for the meal anyway. It's certainly possible given what the character reveals later on, but the film doesn't dwell on it. To leave you with one last subtle, loaded moment to chew on, notice how Carl still opens and closes Yaya's door for her right after their spat in the restaurant when they are crossing to their car through the rain, fulfilling another of society's archaic gender role expectations. The film makes no direct comment on this small action, nor does it draw any attention to it, allowing the moment to instead be open to interpretation or glossed over entirely. Let's question the moment and follow the thread. Is Carl sticking to this gender role expectation to make up for the one he refused moments ago? Is it an unconscious action he does on autopilot to show how deeply ingrained these chivalrous expectations are? Is meeting this particular gender role expectation fine while the other isn't? Are there fewer implications tied to it since it has nothing to do with money? Does money corrupt common decency? Yes. It does. Thanks for watching this video essay. You can click the playlist on screen to check out more of my video essays. I'll see you next time. So long.